Good afternoon, everybody. So, the lecture today is, um, is about the discovery of the Higgs boson. And uh, so I will try to explain what it is and how uh, was it discovered. So, <coughs> the outline is this one. What is the Higgs boson? So it's here that uh, you are going to understand everything, I hope. Out then uh, I will tell a little bit how we search for this uh, object and I will present the results uh, uh, of the, this uh, observation then with uh, data collected in 2011 and 12 and uh, announced in, uh, past in the past in July 4th last year. So what in the world is a X boson? So I, as when we know, we, when we want to know any something, we go to the internet, right? So we have asked, what is the X boson? Nine million answers, right? <laughs> and I have selected this one after reading all of them, of course. And, and it says the X boson or X particle is element, an elementary particle of the standard model of particle physics. And then it says the X field it's a quantum field. Here we start to be confused because we don't know if it is a particle or a field, but now you know that a particle is also a field, so um, that's, that's fine for, for you now. So this field is a quantum field, but this is where it becomes interesting with a non-zero strength that fills all the space and explains why fundamental particles such as quarks and electrons have mass. So this definition is not bad, by the way. It's from Wikipedia. So the standard model answer, um, so I tried to here to be a little bit more precise. So it's indeed, it's a quantum field. It's a field that allows, and, and it was invented for this, it, was, it allows the W and Z bosons, the mediators of weak interaction, to have mass. And doing that, it allows, it makes possible an unified theory of the electromagnetic and weak forces. And as a bonus, it gives masses to the quarks and leptons. So and I will try to, to explain this a little bit more. So I, I think that I already showed this several times. So this is the construction of the standard model of elementary particles along the, the 20th century. So here you see some of the key observations, the kaons, the pions, j psi, upsilon, the zeds, the top quark. Here at, at that point, in the 30s, 40s, um, up to the 50s, the quantum field theory, theory was created, was invented. Uh, I've already mentioned a little bit about that. The quark model was established here in the 60s, and the electroweak theory appears here at the end of the 60s. So, uh, and the X uh, mechanism, the X boson or the X field, many names for the same thing, uh, was introduced, as already said, to unify electromagnetism and weak interaction. So the standard model uh, is then summarized in a table that I have already showed, table of uh, constituents of matter, so quarks and leptons. Uh, with, I already told that we have three generations, then we have here the uh, the bosons responsible for the interactions. We have the gluons for the strong force, the photons, uh, the photon for the electromagnetic interaction, both with zero mass. In this plot, by the way, the scale here is mass. So you see that there are many orders of magnitude of mass in this particle, so from zero up to uh, the top mass that is really the heaviest particle that we know. And then here in the, in the sector of the gauge bosons, the mediators of the interactions, we have these Ws and Zs, and we wanted to unify these things with the photon. And there was here a ed missing element that, uh, that is the X. Now I think that I already showed this, uh, this table comparing, comparing measurements done in various many experiments and the predictions and the two tables coincide quite, uh, quite nicely. So what is mass? So we are concerned about mass. Let's uh, define a little bit what is mass. It's a basic property of particles. Since Newton, mass is a measure of inertia. So force equal, equal to mass times acceleration. So everybody knows this. 
Mass is also a source of the gravitation force. So what is sure is that without mass there would be no atoms, no stars, no galaxies, maybe no universe, at least as, as we know it. So normally mass is given in units of kilograms and uh, in particle physics because the objects are so small kilograms are not really appropriate so we use this uh, giga electron volt, GeV, and one GeV is about 10 to the minus 27 kilograms so uh, to, give you, to give you the scale. Now you may be confused because I, I told that this electron volt is a unit of energy. How can it be a unit of energy at the same time a unit of mass? Well, this is because we work in a system of units where the speed of light is equal to one. Uh, because indeed, uh, this, to be more precise, this should be GV divided by C squared, by the, s the speed of light to the square. But don't, don't worry too much with those, those details. Now, the other thing that we know about mass since Einstein is that mass is energy. So there is this famous equation that gives the relation between energy and mass for a particle that is at rest. If it is not at rest, the particle has this, the mass energy, what we call the mass energy, and but there's also kinetic en energy that is uh, uh, here given by the momentum to the square. And uh, you may eliminate all these Cs. If you put C equal one, the things m become much more simple. So, and so what we know also is that particles with zero mass uh, move at speed of light. So this is a direct consequence of the uh, equations from special rel relativity from, uh, from Einstein. So now moving on now to the, this issue of the particle and field. So I will not spend here too much time because we have already discussed this basic principle of quantum mechanics says that every particle has a field associated. Uh, Einstein got a Nobel Prize uh, for that when he said that light waves are composed by quanta of energy that, he, that now are called photons. More generally, the electromagnetic field, be it uh, radio waves, microwaves, light, etc., are made, uh, is made of photons. And so what we know at, from quantum mechanics uh, is that the Higgs field is composed of Higgs particles. So what, what is a field? Well, uh, for people that do not have um, a background on, f on, on physics or in, uh, or in science, uh, exact science, this notion of a field may be, may be somehow mysterious. So a, f a field here is a continuous uh, medium uh, that uh, uh, with some physical properties. Uh, so the most known field is an electromagnetic field. So it's uh, the field that uh, uh, transmits uh, elec the electromagnetic interaction. So this room is filled with electromagnetic field, with uh, electromagnetic waves. We don't see them, but they, they exist. We, know we see the manifestations of this field every day. When we pick up a phone, we, the, we are using uh, this electromagnetic field. So think about the Higgs field as a similar thing. It fills the space, we don't see it, but we have in in indirect indications that it is there. So, but the point here is that if we see the particle, we know that there is a field. So this is the game. We are not going to observe really the... We are, what we are doing at LHC is to observe excitations of this field that are the particles. And from there, helped by the quantum mechanics and all the, th the theory that we have, we deduce that the space is filled with this Higgs field. Okay, another notion that is important here is this notion of fermions and bosons. So I've already discussed this. The particles are divided, if you want, in, those, in these two big categories, uh, according to the a property that is spin, the, the spin of the particles, and uh, particles with the spin that are half integer uh, are fermions, and those that have a spin, an integer spin like spin one, are bosons. They have different properties. I have already discussed this. The first category, in the first category, we find the particles of matter, electrons, quarks and then the particles of the other uh, generations, the muons, 
but also on the neutrinos. In this category, we find the mediators of the interactions, the photons, the W and Z, the gluon, and uh, the, gravity, the, the, the graviton, if it exists for, the gra gravity, uh, the, for gravity, but I will not talk too much about that. Now, the Higgs boson is something, it's called a boson because it has a spin zero. Zero enters in this class of integer sp spin, so zero, one, two, three, etc. Et so the boson has a spin zero, and we normally call it a scalar. So it's a name like an, any other. So but the interesting point here is that I have this classification of particles. All the particles have either spin, the elementary ones, one half or one. And here is a new elementary particle that is spin zero. It's the first one with spin zero. So it's a special. In that sense, it is special. Now, I will introduce you here some another technical aspect so that later on you can maybe understand a little bit better what happens in wi with the X. Particles of spin one, like uh, the photon, have three, three spin variables. And these three variables are related to the oscillations of the field. So think about now the electrical field or the magnetic field. Uh, that Chris was presenting in one of his lectures, and this field oscillates. They have these oscillations. Now, there are three direct possible directions of oscillations for, for a particle of spin one. Transversal to the direction of propagation of the photon. So a trans transversal, I can have two directions, or then, then two variables. But I can also have uh, oscillations along the, the direction of the movement. So there are three possible variables. So one oscillation modes along the direction of motion and two oscillation modes transverse to the, to, the to the motion. Now it happens that it can be shown that massless particles such as the photon cannot oscillate along the direction of motion. And massive particles can. So the photon has two variables of spin, massive particles have three. So this is a technical aspect that, that is important. It is important. That means that we need two variables to describe the photon regarding its spin. But if this thing would have mass, like the W or the Z, we would need three variables. Now here I come to something more abstract yet. Something that is called young mill theories. So this is, this is something that was introduced, I don't remember exactly in, in which date, but it was uh, at the end of the 50s or something like that, or beginning of the 60s, uh, and <coughs> tried, established a link, a close link, between fundamental interactions and symmetries. So saying that fundamental interactions are derived from a principle of symmetry. Looks quite abstract. Now, what happens here is that, uh, take the electromagnetic interaction. We have the Maxwell equations that describe this, ma this uh, electromagnetic interaction. These equations were built in order to reproduce experimental results. But then at the end we can ask why the interactions have these equations, are described by these equations. In the same way, I can ask why the gravitical force decreases with distance to the square. Why? So why the Maxwell equations have that particular form? And these two guys, Young and Mills, understood that if they impose the principle of symmetry, they said these equations should have, the equations of the theory should be symmetric regarding to a given transformation, so I make this transformation on the objects of the, of the theory, and the equations remain uh, invariant, do not change. The physics do not change. If they do that, they deduce the form, the specific form, the specific mathematical form of the electromagnetic interaction. So the People understood that there are a close, very profound link between the symmetries, principles of symmetries, and, and interactions. Now, <coughs> later on, 
it was found that these, these theories could be applied to the interactions that we, that we knew, so electromagnetic and weak, and weak forces, and also to the strong force. So the, uh, the first one is a symmetry that technically is called U1 cross SU2, and this one is, is a symmetry operation that is called SU3. I'm sure that you didn't understand, but uh, never mind. <laughs> the point is that this is information. These, pr these principles of symmetry are on the basis of the current understanding of particle physics, and it's, it's on the basis of the standard model. So now let's move to the electroweak unification. So we have this uh, electromagnetic force that everybody knows. There are the weak forces uh, describing radioactivity, neutrinos, the sun, etc. And so these two forces have the same origin. And this is based on an underlying symmetry between these two interactions. The equations that describe these two forces are extremely elegant. So elegant that you can write them in a very compact form in a cup of coffee or in a t-shirt. And these equations are those two lines here on top. Forget for the time being these two. So are just this here. Now are these equations that are symmetric under certain, the trans, the certain transformations and this is all what is needed to describe this unification of uh, uh, electromagnetism and uh, weak force. This was very nice, but it was a theoretical construction. Nobody paid too much attention to this when it was presented. So the papers, the number of citations, at least in the years following the, immediately, the papers were not very large. And why? Well, because these equations were very nice if all the particles have zero mass. But this is not the case. So we know that uh, people knew that the photon has mass zero, and this in weak interaction, the mediators should be massive, should have a large mass, because there is a relation between mass and the range of the interaction, and this weak interaction is short range. It only has effect at very small distances. So, because these equations only describe particles of zero mass, they are mathematically interesting, but they don't describe reality, so let's forget about them. And this was the situation for a long number of years. So what people said is that the different masses of the photon relative to W and Z breaks the symmetry. Now, let's have a look now how this electroweak model can be constructed, so how it is constructed, a little bit more information if you want, so about the content of those equations that I showed before, but now in some more graphical form. So what people did was to, to start with two abstract forces. Instead of starting with the electromagnetism and the, the weak force, they started with two abstract forces. Wo one that is mediated by three uh, objects, W plus, W minus, and W zero. Then there is a, a B force with this massless quantum that's called here B zero. Now these objects are related among them. So they, they, are, they may be transformed one on, on the other if you want, the operations of this symmetry group. And this one remains invariant under operations of uh, this other group U1. And then what to reproduce the reality, because the, the point is that at this, at this stage, we had a number of measurements of the weak interaction all the neutrino beam experiments, uh, beta decays where neutrinos are produced. There was enormous amount of experimental data. So we knew, or people knew, what was the form of these interactions. So what we, they were trying to do is to find a mathematical description for something that was already measured. And so and they realized that this, this thing that would be simple well, these three here are the weak force. Uh, this one here is the photon, is the electromagnetic force period that simple. Reality showed to be more complicated. Reality showed that, uh, the measurements showed that in order to, to, to reproduce these measurements, to observe the physical quanta would be mixtures of these two objects, the W0 and the B0. So the photon is a mixture of 77% B0 
zeros and 25, 23% W0 and the reverse for the Z0. What does it mean? You mix particles, but remember that these are waves as well. So field particle, particle versus wave. So and waves, you can mix them. You can superimpose waves. Waves, you can s sum up sound waves and mix them. So in quantum mechanics, mixing these quantum states is something that is normal. So here we are. We have now these 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 objects. We have then the four objects: the, the photon, the Z, the W plus, W minus, and W plus. And these are the combined electroweak force quanta. Well, the problem was, as I already told, they would be all massless, and the force strengths would be about equal. And we knew that uh, electromagnetism is an interaction much more strong than the weak force. So the reality was indeed that uh, these objects were massive and, uh, and the strengths of the interactions were different. And the Z0, by the way, just to make a bridge to, to a previous lecture, was, was observed in the so-called neutral current neutrino events discovered at CERN in a bubble chamber that was at the name Gargamel. Now, in the 60s, from several directions came a number of break breakthrough ideas to allow non-zero masses. And this is today known as the X, the, these ideas are known as the X mechanism. They crystallized in the X mechanism. A number of people contributed to, to, to this. Englert, uh, Francois Englert and uh, Brut in Belgium. Peter Higgs in Scotland, Guralnik, Egan and Kibble in, in the US. So, and before them, there were others that uh, were already talking about uh, the writing papers in uh, pointing in this direction. So today we use Higgs, if you want, as a composite person. Partially Peter Higgs, there he is, uh, uh, next to our detector in one visit that he made to CERN. Um, but uh, essentially we have to realize that many, some other people contributed to this. Now, these ideas all started from nothing, from the vacuum. Now, in classical physics, a vacuum exists in a volume where you remove all matter, right? So you remove the, ma the matter, there is nothing, this is the vacuum. Now, here, the X exists in the vacuum. The key postulate of the Higgs mechanism is this one, is to say we have a new force field, this Higgs field, that has an average value in the vacuum that became non-zero as the early universe cooled down. So this, uh, so we start seeing here a, a bridge, a hint of a bridge to cosmology that I will exploit tomorrow, in the, in the lecture tomorrow. But so the main thing is that I have a field that fills the vacuum with an average value that is non-zero. So how it looks like this field? So this field is described by some variables. The field here I'm describing it by the variables phi1 and phi2, or phi1 and phi2. Think about that uh, as a complex field that has two components, but never mind. So the field here has two components, and this phi is the, the X, uh, the, is, this is the X field. On the vertical axis, I have the energy of the field. Okay? So this is a graph, is a, a graph in three dimensions instead of two dimensions, because instead of having just here one axis, I have two. I have phi 1 and phi 2. And the shape of this potential, of this, pot this potential, of this en energy, is is like a bottom uh, of uh, the, the the bottom of a bottle. So you have here this uh, uh, the, the central part that looks also as a Mexican hat. Some people call this the Mexican hat potential. So, and the the thing that you see that is different in this type of field is that when phi 1 and phi 2 are 0, 
there is no field, it's, the field is zero. The energy is not the minimum. The minimum is here, is in this circumference. So every physics, physical system tends to be in the state of minimal energy. If it is in high energy, it decays to the naturally to the minimal energy. So if we think about the vacuum as the state of minimum energy, you have to say, if I have this potential for the Higgs field, then in the vacuum, the, f the Higgs should be somewhere in this circumference. It should have some value in this circumference. Now, you can imagine that uh, we have the field at this point, in this point, it's zero, and, that's for and if it, it will naturally and spontaneously roll down to one of the points of the circumference. That's, and when it does, it chooses a particular direction in this two-dimension space phi 1, phi 2, right? So, and in a sense, it breaks the symmetry. So if I have a symmetry that is the, the symmetry that around all this potential, if I rotate it, is symmetric, right? So, but when this uh, ball here in red chooses this position, it chooses a particular position, so it breaks the symmetry. The thing is not no, no more symmetric. So, and this is what this is why we call also this mechanism the spontaneous symmetry breaking mechanism. So, here it is what uh, what, we, what happens when we I, we put a field like this in the equations. The X field fills the space of the the universe. Uh, in universe, the field has a non-zero value in the energy minimum. The symmetry is broken when the field is at minimum. And the W and Z particles get mass through the interaction with the X field. In the, the equations, this corresponds to these two extra lines that are here. So now it appears here this, this phi, that, that are the X field that I described before with this potential, this, uh, this V here. This was done, so these two equations were written by Weinberg and Salam in 1668. Steven Weinberg and Abdul Salam, they took a theory, uh, a model developed by Glaschel some years before, and they have added these X fields with four components corresponding to these equations. Now I'm complicated the thing, so I show the picture with the, f the, f the X with two components. Now it has four. So the real thing has four components. And they I introduced the non-zero average value of the X field and look to the consequence. So they changed the, the, the equations to represent then the field around this minimum, around the minimum. And what happened? Well, what happened is that these four components of the uh, so the equations changed, and these four components of this field, this X field that they have introduced, one got massive. So appeared a term that represents the mass of a field. It's a term of the form m squared times phi squared. And three new massless boson, bosons that he called the gold, Goldstone boson. And it, it's here that uh, a math miracle happens. And the three variables that are describing these goldstone bosons without mass, they become, in the equations, the description of the oscillation of the W plus, W minus, and Z zero in the direction of motion, the third direction of spin that I have mentioned before. So there was not a fourth goldstone boson to do the same to the photon, so the photon stayed mass massless. So these three got an oscillation in the direction of motion, so they acquired mass, the photon not. So in a colloquial way, we used to say that W plus W minus and Z zero eat the Goldstone bosons and acquire mass. So this is the description of what happened in the equations. Uh, so without showing the, the real equation, but this is the interpretation that we can make of, uh, of these equations. Now, uh, now let's move on. The added bonus is that non-zero average value of these fields can also give mass to quarks, electrons, and muons, and in fact to all point-like particles. 
And also, an old theoretical problem that was affecting the quantum theory of the weak force was solved. And this problem was, was that the probability of two Ws to interact become larger than one at very high energies. And this was really a problem. The probability cannot be larger than one. And this happens for energies, collisions energies, of above one TV. Now, why how the X uh, fields solves this? Uh, it solves this because these two Ws, this is, these are Feynman diagrams that describe the fusion of this uh, fusion, interaction of W, minus, uh, w plus and W minus. And, uh, and they produce here a Z or a gamma, and they, they produce it in the, uh, in the final state, a W plus and a W minus as well. And this thing, as I said, the probability grows with energy. At some point, it's above 1. Now, if I have the X, another mechanism can happen is that the X can be here. So I, have, I can have another diagram. And when we sum up these two diagrams, it turns out that the probability is constant with energy. So uh, this technically solved the problem. So this was all very well. This was done, this work was done in the, in the end of the 60s, so some 40 years ago. And, uh, and the, the model had some predictions has many predictions indeed, and as I showed in the first transparency, all the predictions agree with the experimental data. So the model is, is rather good. There was just one little loose end in all this, is that in spite of decades of attempts, there was no direct experimental confirmation or falsification of the X fields or the X boson. So, and this is where we come to the LHC. Now I will tell you a little bit about how we try to search for the exposure. So, end of theory, and now we go to the experiment. Proton collisions at LHC, so I have already told you that uh, this is what we do. We collide protons with beams at 7 TV of energy. Uh, many particles are colliding, and, uh, and the reason that we have to collide many particles and make many, many collisions is that the processes that we are looking at are very rare, very, really very rare. So the probability, this is the probability of the collision of two protons, this collision rate, and this is the rate of this uh, production of X. You see uh, X in something, don't, don't uh, look too much in these details, but so the X is here, it's 13 orders of magnitude below. So the probability is 10 to the 13 lower. So that's why we have, if we have a very low probability, we have to try many times. And this is what we do. We try many collisions to see if we produce some of these X. Now, as I already told also, um, the standard model does not work at high energy without the X particle or an alternative new physics. There was this WW interaction, probability above one for energies above one TV. This was a clear indication that above t one TV something had to happen. And this is why, it's, it's interesting, this is why people were confident enough to spend six billion euros in the LHC. Was one of the main, the key arguments. So we have now an accelerator capable to exploit this energy domain. Here we go. We build the accelerator. We build the detectors. We put all these nations together. We build a big collaboration. We have many pe enthusiastic people. Here is a photo of the CMS, uh, my collaboration, 15% of the people. This is not a real detector. This is a, a photo upstairs. This is the, the whole assembly all in the surface. And we start doing collisions. And when we collide two protons, this is what happens. We collide two protons, and we have zillions of particles that are produced. Zillions, okay, uh, hundreds of particles that are produced. So this is a, a reconstruction uh, in computer of what the detectors see. So we have all these detectors with millions of channels of uh, individual sensors. And then uh, this data goes to a computer that reconstructs the, this collision so that identifies the trajectories of the charged particles, the energies, these towers here represent energies deposited in, this color, in the calorimeters, in the cells of the calorimeters, for example, in the crystals that I have talked about. 
And this happens at one billion times per second, these collisions, is the rate of collision at LHC. So, and all of them look similar, but we, and we are not interested in, in many of them, or in the most part of them. So we are interested in one out of 10 to the 13, as I told you. So how do we separate these, co these in interesting collisions from those, the maj large, large majority that are not interesting? Well, there are a number of key features of things that are rare. First, they produce leptons. They produce muons. Here I have muons, it's four muons. Or they produce electrons, or they produce photons. Uh, all the particles that are related to the proton, the proton is made of quarks, right? And when I have the two protons colliding, these quarks, in a sense, multiplicate by the mechanism that I've already described, the fragmentation of the quarks, and give jets, give many particles. But when something special, a Z, a X, or what is, comes out are leptons, and these are much more rare. And the second feature is that these electrons are very high energy, or these leptons in, are very high energy relative to the, in the transverse direction. So normally what happens most of the time is that the two particles collide and the products of the collision goes in, in the forward direction. If I have an hard interaction between two quarks, particles tend to be produced at 90 degrees transverse to the direction of the collision. So I'm looking for leptons of high energy transverse to the direction of the collisions. So very, in a very simplistic way, this is uh, the, key, the key ingredients for, to look for these, uh, for these rare processes, like this one. So here I have two, uh, uh, four muons. Two by two, these muons form a Z. So a Z boson can decay in two muons. And if we reconstruct the mass of uh, a pair of these muons, I obtain something close to, to the Z and the same for the other pair. Now, so we uh, started making all kinds of measurements when the beams were initiated at by the end of 2009. 2010, we measured uh, essentially all the processes of the standard model. So we measured kaons, uh, sigma, upsilon, j psi, z, tops. So in a sense, we rediscovered uh, the standard model of, of particles. Here are the real dates of the discoveries of these particles. We made uh, many, many measurements. And uh, for example, this is, these are measurements of the probability of producing top quarks, a top and uh, anti-top, a pair of particle, antiparticle of this heaviest quark. The, the, the points in color are the, the, the experimental measurements. So, each one of these points is a different measure, a different way to measure the same thing, if you want. And this gray band represents the theory prediction. So the theory prediction has also some errors. The, the, this is something that, uh, that we, sh we should also consider, is that the theory itself uh, uh, has a number of ingredients to come up with a number, and these ingredients have errors so that such that the final number here has also some error. And But what you see is that the, the extraordinary agreement between the experiment and the prediction. Now, here, are pr pr this is the production of Ws, Zs, a pair of a W and a photon, a pair of a Z and a photon, two Ws, etc. On the vertical axis, so it's written production cross-section. Cross-section is a technical word to say probability. So if you say, see cross-section, translate that by probability. So in a given, in given units, if you want. So, and it's more easy, more probable to produce Ws than pairs of Ws, than two Ws. So and there are several orders of magnitude between these two probabilities. It's normal. It's more difficult to produce two objects than just one. And, uh, but you see here that the, uh, the data points that are the red dots match very well the blue band, the blue bars that are the theoretical predictions. So in all cases, uh, there is an excellent, an excellent agreement. 
So many more physical results were obtained. So I will not discuss this. Uh, these two I already showed. No, this one not. But so in total, more than 500 papers from the LHC experiments have already been published. And in all the cases, the agreement with the standard model is absolutely fantastic. Now, how do we analyze the data? I'll give you an example. It's, it's very simple. It's really simple. So I'm looking for events, for collisions, where two muons are produced, a pair of muons. So I'm searching now for particles, a particle X that decays in two muons. Right? The, pr the particle X is produced in the collision. This particle X has a very short lifetime. It decays in two muons. And are the muons that traverse the detector. The muons have a long lifetime. They, con they have time to traverse the detector and to be measured. Now, I measure the muons. From the muons, that means from the measurement of the energy and momentum of the muons, and using the equations of Einstein, the special relativity, I compute the mass of the particle X. Right? And now I, I build a plot where on the horizontal axis I have the mass of this muon pair and on the vertical axis I have the number of collisions where I have observed a muon pair with a given mass. Okay? So here is events per interval year of mass and you see that I have many, many events. So this is uh, 10 to the 6 or something. And, and this is a spectrum. It's a distribution. So I have many events. I have uh, here in this result millions of uh, events, collisions, where two muons were identified, and I see a distribution and I see peaks. These peaks correspond to an increase of probability of producing two muons. And this increase happens because at that, in that particular mass exists a particle. There is a particle with that particular mass. That's why there is a peak. So when I see here the eta, the the rho, omega phi, the j psi, the psi prime, the upsilon, the z, and somehow here should appear the, the x, because the x also can decay into muons. Why I don't see the x here? Well, because the x, uh, the probability to produce the x is very small, and here I have fluctuations. Uh, I have uh, the statistical precision is not enough to, to see the x here. So this is the problem. It looks simple to identify, to measure a particle, to identify a particle. So I measure these things, I make a plot, I see a peak. Here it is, the particle discovered. For the X was a little bit more complicated. And to give you a, a hint why it was more complicated, I do now the same thing, but instead of using two muons, I use four. So I'm looking now for events with four leptons, be it muons or electrons. So. Uh, Electrons and muons are, are the same for, for this, so are, they are both leptons. So I'm looking for four leptons, and I make the same thing. I, take, I measure the four leptons. With the four leptons, I reconstruct the mass of the particle that decaying gives the four leptons, computes its mass, so it's the mass of the four L, L is lepton, and I put here the number of events for, as a function of this mass. And what you see is that the number of events for each one of these intervals here is very small. So I have here two events for the scale. The, the, the scale of the previous graph, the previous plot, was millions. Here it's are units. So that's, that's why, uh, and this is, it's like that because the X is rare, or because these processes producing uh, four leptons are rare. So, but I see some. Are all of these X? No. No, there are other processes in the, in the standard model that produce, uh, that produce four, four leptons. And those are here. So this, this color band here, this color thing, is the prediction uh, obtained b from simulation what the standard model, with the interactions that we know, without the X, would, would give in terms of uh, events with four leptons. And so I can produce two Zs. And these Zs, each one decaying two leptons, so I have the four then, and this is the prediction. Now, these lines here in color that appear here are a, sim is a, a simulation of what I would expect if I have a X here of 140 GV, here of uh, 200, and here of 350, right? And you see that 
I would see a peak, okay, but now these events here, do, do I see a peak here or not? Uh, so this is the problem with when I have two, two, a number of events that is small, is that it requires sophisticated methods to isolate the signal from the background, if I want to use, make full use of the data. So when I look, well, this is a plot that was obtained in 2011. So at this point, there was no, no indication here that there is here a, a X. The X can decay in ZZ and then in four leptons, but I don't see here nothing uh, clearly pointing to the existence of the X. If I don't measure something, I can nevertheless put experimental limits. I can say the probability to produce this thing is below some value, or the cross-section is, uh, is below some value. And the, so these plots appear very much when X results are presented, so I will describe it uh, uh, shortly. Uh, so, we, in this axis, represents this cross-section or this probability divided by the probability of the standard model. So, if the two things are equal, the result should be one. Now, these lines here give the probability of the cross-section to be equal or smaller than a given value. And if the value is one, that means equal or smaller than the standard model prediction. Okay? So, for example, this point here, that is equal to 2 means that at this mass 120, the probability to produce the X is at least smaller than two times the standard model prediction. Here it is smaller than the standard model prediction. So that means that when this line is below the red line, I have excluded the standard model prediction. The probability is below the, the is already below the prediction. So in these curves, I have always the this line, the full line, that is the observed limit measured experimentally, and this then dot dash, dashed line, that is the prediction, the expected limit it computed from simulation. And the two things normally should agree if there is nothing. Now here, we observed in 2011 that the expected limit is here, but the observed limit is slightly above. So, and it's above, so the green band represents one sigma, 68% probability. The, the yellow band represents two sigma, 95% probability. So I'm already in the upper limit at 95% probability, so 5% probability of being just a fluctuation. So this could be an indication uh, of something happening in that region. Uh, in fact, uh, with this plot was for the ZZ. But the X may decay in, the, may decay in, no, in a number of, uh, of channels, and we combine then all the channels together. We mix all the things, so we increase our sensitivity. And the result in 2011 was this one. So the, so the limit for production of X was below the red line between 127.5 and 600. That means that we have excluded in 2011 Xs with masses in this interval. There is a point that is crucial here, is that the theory, the standard model, doesn't predict the value of the X mass. It's like that. And, uh, and so that's why this thing was also not trivial, because we didn't know exactly where to look at. And, uh, uh, this, this plot goes up to 600. It, 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 it doesn't go above because our experiment doesn't have sensitivity to go above. But also we know that if the X is the standard model X, it should be in this area. So this was kind of disappointing because we have excluded almost all, all of the region. But there was this excess here. So this is the limit, predict, the, the expected limit, what I expect if there is no X. But the measurements were giving this slight excess here. And so in December 2011, we came to the media saying, well, we have may seen maybe a hint of the X particle. And we moved to take data in 2012. And this is the last part of this, uh, of this lecture. So, and the things in 2012, as well as in the previous year, worked extremely well. I mean, the accelerated accelerated behaved 
uh, extremely well. This is the, uh, the total integrated luminosity. It's the number of collisions, if you want, that were uh, produced and registered by the experiments. And, and here you see 2000, so it increases with time. This is time along the year. So this is February and uh, etc. No, this is May, sorry. And this is uh, July, etc. And you see that each year, the increase of number of collisions in, in tape or in disk grows much faster. So here in 2010, so the increase was small, barely visible in this plot, here 2011, 2012. Each year, was, uh, the intensity was, was being higher than the previous one. Now, come back here to some, some information that we had from previous experiments regarding the Higgs. The Higgs, the masses of the Higgs, of the top quark and of the Ws are related. There is a relation in the standard model between the masses of the, these two objects, of these three objects. And the reason is that the mass, in, in quantum physics, the mass of a particle depends on these quantum fluctuations. Remember that I have told you about quantum fluctuations? A W can at a, at a given point transform itself in a top quark and a bottom quark that come back and I later again giving the same W. So the W particle have this fluctuation. So at some point it disappears, it produces a top and a bottom, they coalesce again and give a W. And the W this can do another thing is to have this an X that is emitted and reabsorbed. So here is the W, it at some point emits a X and it's reabsorbed. So it's another fluctuation. And these fluctuations uh, are computed by the theory. So they, they are taken into account when we, you compute the masses of these objects. So when, if you are computing the mass of the W, you have to take into account the mass of the X, and here you have to take into account the mass of the top, right? So the plot that results from these computations is this one. This, gra this axis here is the mass of the W, this one is the mass of the top, and lines like these are lines of constant mass of the X. So this is the relation that in the standard model. So this line, for example, here is 115 GV. So if, and this line here is 600 GV, right? So this means that if I measure the mass of the W and the mass of the top, I can go to this plot, see where is the line of the X and see what is the prediction for the X mass. Now, the measurements of the W and top are those ones in March 2012, and they correspond, they have some error, and this error correspond to this ellipsis here. So there are two errors in the W, in the top, so this combined makes this ellipse here. It's the green ellipse. Forget about the other ellipse, the red one and the yellow, forget about those. So, so that means that if the standard model is correct, I should have X masses crossing this ellipse. So that means something that is below 115, that would be a line here in this extreme of the ellipse, and another on the other extreme that would be something about 130 or so. So this would be the range expected from the standard model. Now, at that point, March 2012, all of these had been excluded. So that's why it's white, Bit, as I told you. So we have excluded between 127 and 600. Below 114, it has been excluded by LEP, that is an electron-positron collider that existed at CERN in the, in the 80s and 90s. So the only possible region for the X to exist, if the standard model is correct, is this tiny band here between 115 and 127. This was the situation at the end of 2011. Now the theory, the standard model is real, really remarkable. It gives a number of, it doesn't predict the X mass, but it predicts, it predicts the production rate for the X, and the probability to produce uh, X. So and this, is, this, are, this graph here shows this probability as a function of the mass of the X. So, and you see that the probability decreases with the mass. That's why above a given value, we are no more sensitive because the probability is so, so small that we cannot produce Xs with the number of collisions that we have. These are different mechanisms for, to produce the X 
and this now forget about this, this is too detailed. So, but essentially this one is what happens, two gluons fuse and give a, give a X. So I know from theory what I expect in terms of probability, in terms of cross-section. I know how many X I should produce if I do 10 billion collisions. The other thing that uh, the theory predicts is if I produce the X, how it decays. Now, and this is given by this graph. So the probability for the X to decay is called the branching ratio, and this is given by a probability value up to one. And here there are a number of lines, very complicated, but what it essentially does, it says that if I have a X of 500 GV mass, I come here and I see, okay, I have WW, can decay in WW at with 80% of probability, in ZZ with their 50%, and in top top with uh, 20%, something uh, wrong. Uh, you got the idea. Now, we knew that if it exists, it is in this region, between 115 and 127. Um, and in this region, the plot is very complicated. That means that in this region, there are, the X has many possibilities of decay. It can decay in uh, two big quarks, in gluon gluon, in tau tau, this tau lepton. It can decay in two photons. It can also decay in WW for sure and in ZZ. Uh, but it has all these possibilities. One way to test the theory is to measure these, all these different possibilities of decay and see if they agree with this prediction. So what we did was to exploit these two, the five, we call it decay modes. We exploit five decay modes. The ZZ decay mode, the gamma gamma, the WW, and these other two, BB and tau tau, that are indicated here. So these two are the best ones, ZZ and Gamma Gamma, because they have high sensitivity and high mass resolution. That means that I can compute the mass of the X very precisely. Here I cannot, because the Ws uh, decay with neutrinos, and neutrinos are not very well measured, and those ones are complicated because of other reasons that I will not go through. So I have we have collected data. Uh, and uh, in 2012, and these results that I will show you here are with data collected until September 2012. Now we have something, some more data on this that we are analyzing now. So we knew that uh, with uh, uh, that with uh, this data, we knew uh, how, ma how many eggs we expect. So what is the statistical precision? So we could compute what is the expected sensitivity. So the expected sensitivity is normally uh, expressed in something that is called the p-value. So the p-value is a probability. It's a probability that the background fluctuates to give an excess as large as the signal as, as expected from, from the X. So if I have background processes, you have these plots, you have events, I can have, I expect uh, from the background 10 events, but I observe 15. So that means that, well, the background, the, the average value is 10, but it fluctuates and gave uh, 15. But if I expect 10 and I observe 100, that we, should, we need to have a very big uh, f statistical fluctuation for go to go from 10 to 100. So, and this is and this is can be com com uh, uh, quantified in terms of the probability. So this p-value gives the probability of those fluctuations. And so with the data, with the accuracy that, uh, of the data that we were ex expected to collect in 2012, we knew that at, 120 at year at 125, we expect a probability uh, to for of 10 to the minus 15 for the background to be equivalent to the signal that we uh, should observe. So this is uh, uh, really a very small probability. So there is really no uh, uh, no chance of being mistaken by by statistics. So this is normally we express this sensitivity not not in terms of uh, probability, but in terms of number of standard deviations that we call sigma. And in this case, the expected sensitivity sensitivity is 7.8 sigma. Now, coming to the results. So this is one of the events uh, where this is a candidate of a X decaying in two photons. 
So I have this is one collision, and uh, I have a number of particles of low energy, so they have deflected, so that means that they have low energy, they are deflected by the field, and then I have here these two spikes that correspond to very large energy deposit in crystals of the calorimeter, and, uh, and uh, these crystals correspond, this energy corresponds to the two photons. One photon went there, another photon went there. Now, if I want to measure photons, now I have to, to do a number of technical things to come to the, final, to the final result. So I show you this plot. I will not go through it. It's kind of technical. But it's just to give you an idea of the kind of things that we have to do before presenting the result. So I need to know the mass of the X. So the mass of the X is computed from the mass of the photons in which it decays. How do I measure the, the mass of the energy of the photons? Well, by the signal that is given in these crystals. How stable are these signals? Well, this, it's not so stable, because if I look to this signal, I see that as a function of the day and months along the year, the signal goes down and then goes up and then goes down again and so on, by a few percent, but it's, it's still sizable. So I have to calibrate my instrument. And, and I have, uh, have uh, 80,000 crystals uh, in a large volume. How do I calibrate that? So, well, I have to build a system to calibrate this. So I have to have a laser sending fibers to all the crystals with very standard light that, that I can then use as a reference for, for to correct for this, effect, for this effect. Where it comes from, this effect? Why it's not flat? Well, because the crystals have some sensitivity to radiation, and when they uh, get radiation, they get a little bit darker, so the transmission of light in the crystal is smaller and I lose signal, but then I stop here, I stop the accelerator and they recover a little bit and so on, so I have to follow the, all these variations. So this is, uh, uh, this is very important to get, to get good results from the, from the calorimeter in, in terms of the measurement of the photons. Another important thing is that electrons and photons behave similarly in the calorimeter, and the Z boson decays in two electrons, so electron positron. The Z, I know very well its mass, so 91 GV, and I can reconstruct events, uh, this peak of the Z with two electrons. This is a, another way, independent way, to calibrate my, my energy of the crystal calorimeter. So once I have I did all of that, I go and look at uh, the diphoton mass spectra. So the same exercise that I did before for the two muons and then for the four leptons. Now I do for two photons. I take two photons, events with two photons, I select those and so on, and I compute with the two photons the mass, and I, here I put the number of events that I see as a function of mass. And because I want to be, uh, to, to, to take the all the, the information as uh, uh, possible from, from the data, I have divided my data in several categories. Here I, s I show six categories. In fact, there are 11 categories. As a function of the region of the calorimeter, as a function of the single to background rates, show as a function of a number of things. But the important point is that I look to this, and this is almost, this is the data already with ATV. And I know now that we have uh, X at 125 GV, and I look at 125, here is this point, and I'm starting to see if I see any peak in this data. Do you see a peak in this data? Do you see any signal in this data? I don't. By eye, I don't see anything. So, but now I go and massage all this data with statistical methods, so that's why I have all these, these categories, because I wanted to increase my sensitivity. And then I get, as a final result, I get this. So I get a distribution where now I have this continuum that are the standard model, normal gamma gamma events, photon photon events. And then I have this small peak here on top. So this is statistically significant. This is an excess that corresponds to a new particle and that we now interpret as, as the X. So there is this excess, and uh, having seen this excess, so I s I s and having quantified it and so on, we s can say, well, there is here a new particle, and this new particle, I know it's a boson. It's not a fermion. Cannot be, cannot have a spin one half or a, 
was uh, or other because it decays into photons and the, f two the photon has spin one. And it cannot also have a spin one, cannot be a spin one because for some other reason uh, the, uh, a particle of spin one cannot decay into photons. So this particle has to be a boson. It has to be to have a spin, integer spin, but cannot be spin one. So it can be spin zero, can be spin two, can be spin three, but it's then it's uh, very unlikely. Now spin two is still a possibility because we don't know if this particle is an elementary particle or if it is composite. It could be a composite particle. We don't know. It just saw a bump in a distribution. So the next thing is to measure the spin. So this is something that uh, we have started to do. We don't have yet uh, final, final results, even if the preliminary results indicate pointing to the direction of spin zero. Now, I do a number, we do, uh, in every measurement, we do a number of, of, of cross-checks. And uh, one of these uh, is illustrated in this plot where I showed the result of um, what we call the signal strength. The signal strength is the probability that I measure divided by the probability of the standard model of producing this x. So it's the cross-section divided by the cross-section of the standard model. If the standard model is, cor is correct, it should give 1 as a result. And I have here many numbers. Uh, each number corresponds to a different measurement, so to this individual result from each these categories. And so and they all agree with the an average value, so the average is here, the green bar is the error, and the result, so this average is 1.56 plus or minus 0.43. So if it is 1, it's the standard model. Here it is 50% above the standard model, but the error is 0.3, it's very large. So it's, it's we say it's compatible with the standard model. So when the deviation from the expectation is of the order of the standard model, one or two sigmas, it is, it is uh, compatible. Now, these now are the results for, uh, for ZZ in four leptons. So the type of events that I have shown or discussed already. So here, this is an event with two muons and two electrons. I have here the two green things that are the electrons, and the red tracks are the two muons. And, uh, so again, the technical slide. Here, the problem in this measurement is to estimate as accurately as possible the background from the standard model. So I know that the X here produces four leptons, but the standard model can also produce four leptons from other, for, from other mechanisms. And I have to have a very good estimation of that, a very precise estimation such that when I look to the data, so this is the distribution of four leptons, so here the points are the data points, right? And the blue thing is the prediction from the standard model. So, and then I see if I have an excess above the prediction. And in order to see if this point here that corresponds to the excess at 125, if this is really an excess, I have to be very sure of the blue line. Because if the blue line, by some reason, is two times as, is, is here lower than what it should be, if it should be here, then here, then this fluctuation that now I'm calling the X uh, would not be there, right? So here we see in this plot uh, an excess that corresponds to the X, but this is a small excess. It's 3.1 sigma. It's, uh, it's, uh, it could be still a fluctuation of the background. So then we did something more sophisticated that I will go through quickly, is to look at the decay of these objects, so the directions, the angles between all these leptons, the four leptons. So there are many angles here. So I have a proton, proton colliding, two Zs that are produced, and then the Zs decay into, into muons. So this defines, all these directions define several, these different planes, so I can define several different angles here, and I can look to the distribution of this angle. And I, I know from my models that the standard model background has this shape, the X should have that shape. Standard model has that shape, the X should have that shape. So this is additional information that allows us to disentangle 
the x on the background. And we invented a, n a variable, a new variable that we called KD, uh, the K discriminant, that is this variable here, and look as a function of the mass. The point, the dots are the data, the data points, and the colors are what I expected. So red is high probability, blue is low probability. So I expect if it is background, I expect the data to be here and to be there. If, uh, if it is X, the X or the scene, I expect to be here. So I see that my data points, I have a concentration in this region, and this increases very much the probability for those events to be due to the X. So I hope that this gives you an idea of uh, how these things are looked at. Uh, at the end, I'm going to skip the, I have a, here a, a number of slides about the other decay modes, uh, WW and, uh, and, uh, and the other two. I will not go in any detail on this, just to, to tell you that in the other modes, we saw always the same pattern. In this region, around 125, an excess relative to, to the expectation, so this line, this uh, solid line above the dotted line of the expectation. Uh, in the tau tau mode, the X decaying tau tau again, so this is the, the expectation, and at 135, the measurement is above, and the same thing for uh, the BB, so two bottom quarks, the X decaying two bottom quarks associated to uh, uh, a WRZ. And uh, again, the same thing. So this is the expectation. This is the observation. So now we can combine everything, all the information that we have, run a big uh, uh, package of, uh, to fit the data. So I combine the f my five channels, and I get here my local p-value, this probability that I have mentioned before, and, that, and I see a huge peak at 125 at uh, seven standard deviations that corresponds to a probability that is really uh, very, very small of the order 10 to the minus 12 or something. So this is it. This is the X. So I have excluded all this region apart this peak that appears at 125. So we have measured the mass of the object with uh, precision. So this is a fit, a li um, maximum likelihood fit, so normally appears uh, with this type of curves. The minimum is here, it's at 125.8 plus or minus 0.6 GV. The interval of the error is this one. And uh, the signal strength, that is the probability of producing, uh, for producing this, for the, pr the probability for produ observed probability of producing this object is 88% of the standard model prediction, so 0.88 plus or minus 20%, so the error is still big. So these are the five channels, so you see that each one, so here in this plot, the dashed line is the standard model, so corresponding to one, the ratio is one, and this is the average 0.88, and these are the individual channels. All of them are not zero, are not compatible with zero. Zero would mean no X, so we, zero is here. One is the standard model, and these are the observations. Then we have looked into more detail into the couplings to the, the, so the, the strengths of the couplings, the, the, the strengths of the interaction to fermions and bosons, and uh, I will not describe this in detail. This, this is really a more technical plot, but what, what I wanted to show you is that here, the standard model prediction is here, is this point, is when this value, this coupling to the fermions is one, and this coupling to the bosons is one. If it was nothing, it was here, it should be zero, zero. The measurement is this gray ellipse it's here, and this is 68% uh, confidence interval, so one sigma. And you see that the, the prediction, the standard model value is with very compatible with the measurement. So the point is that the precision is still not good enough. I mean, uh, these ellipses are still uh, errors that are of the order of 20 to 50 percent. So the precision is not uh, very good to say with uh, cer certainty that this is really the standard model X. Now, I have to all the results I've presented are from my experiment, CMS. There is, I told you that uh, there is another experiment that does ex essentially the same. And this is Atlas. I show here the p-values 
and they see the same pattern, the same uh, peak, so the same very low probability of uh, at, at the same mass around one, and they, they, they see it at 126, a little bit higher than us, but uh, still compatible within the arrows. So here it is. Both LHA experiments have observed the new boson with a mass near 125 at a significance above 5 sigma. And then uh, we have uh, so big news. Uh, so this was announced in all the media in the world. Um, here, this is this guy here is the DG of CERN, the Director General, and uh, this is the uh, the spokesperson of, uh, of CMS. So this I work with this guy. And um, so we printed a T-shirt, and uh, with our uh, diphoton result and the ZZ result, and uh, I receive every week at home the Economist. And as far as I remember, this was the first time science featured in the first page, the cover page of the Economist, a giant leap for science, because usually. What comes in the front page of the Economist is what it came now in small print. If you can read there, in the small print says uh, uh, Britain's banking scandal spreads, a power struggle at the Vatican. <laughs> so these are the type of things that. So for one time we get a, an optimistic uh, view from the Economist. So uh, we have published uh, the. The papers of the discovered the observation papers in the in the same issue of Physics Letters B, that is uh, one of the top journals for f for this physics, is an European journal. We, we had a bit of a struggle to decide in which journal we are going to publish this. Uh, finally, we came up with uh, we decided for uh, Physics Letters, and Physics Letters is very conservative. It's British, so very conservative, and uh, they have this color in the front page is always the same. Uh, and for the first time in the history of physics letters B, they, they put some pictures on the, on the, on the cover page. <laughs> for the first time where you can see a plot, uh, uh, a photo uh, in the cover. So, uh, and uh, the title of the uh, Atlas paper is Observation of a New Particle in the Search of the Standard Model X Boson with the Atlas Detector at LHC, and a, a statement says, and, and the, uh, at some point in the paper, compatible with the production of a decay, um, to the compatible with the production and decay of the Standard Model X Boson, and uh, the CMS paper, the title is Observation of a New Boson at a Mass of 125 GV with the CMS experiment at the LHC, and we say consistent within uncertainties with expectations from the standard model X boson. So I'm approaching the end. What is this boson? So the truth is that we still don't know exactly what it is. So is, is there one X boson or more? So we have seen one, but it could be that others are still there or are not yet visible, that they could be visible with more data. Is it point-like point -like particle, an elementary particle, or is it composite? In particular, is it spin zero or not? This is key for this question of compos compositeness. There are some models that uh, predict a composite particle of spin two. The data now indicates that it's more like spin zero, but it's not yet conclusive are all the probabilities as predicted. The production probabilities, the decay, these branching ratios in the different the five channels. Well, uh, or not. Uh, within a 20 to 50 percent error, yes, but we need to be more precise, go to the below 5 percent to be more affirmative. So and this will take years. So of course the red answer here means new physics. And uh, so this is what, uh, uh, what we know also is that from for reasons that I will tell tomorrow, new physics behind the standard model is quite likely. So, uh, and this is uh, an encouragement to pursue and to continue with these experiments for, uh, for a, number, a number of years. So I think this is what's a major, major discovery in physics. This new boson is either a standard model X or a X-like particle in any case. So the electro-X symmetry breaking is very likely due to some kind of X field. 
So all this agreement uh, with, uh, between model and experiment points in that direction. So the hypothesis that the space is filled with the Higgs field since the origin of the universe is a plausible assumption. So I think that we have now a new framework to understand the universe, and in particular cosmological models, some cosmological models uh, that said told, told you about become more plausible. The universe inflation after the Big Bang, and the fact that the idea that the energy of Higgs field could be at the origin, the source of all matter in the universe, this becomes uh, less, uh, less uh, so more plausible as I, as I told. So, and uh, I think that I will stop here uh, and uh, continue tomorrow.